All right, everyone. Uh, I'm here today with a, a hero of mine, Dr. Cialdini. He's known worldwide as the godfather of influence. He's got a strong background in influence and persuasion. He's written several books, uh, Influence, as you can see over his shoulder there. Another book called Yes, 50 Scientifically Proven Ways to Be Persuasive. And another one called Persuasion, which is very fascinating. We'll talk about that a little later as well. And um, one of the things that, um, you know, really gets me so excited is I grew up in this business um, working, going door to door and, and sitting in a call center, dialing on the phone. And I was not an academic like you, Dr. Cialdini. Um, and so having someone that, that really had that science behind these principles uh, was absolutely fascinating. So I'm so grateful to have you here. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Well, I'm glad to be with you. And you're right about uh, a commitment I make uh, to all the people that I speak to is that anything I conclude, anything that I recommend will be based on uh, properly conducted uh, and controlled scientific research that shows that if you if you ask something this way, you get this many people who say yes to it. But if you ask the same thing this way, you get this many people to say yes to it. So we actually have the data. <laughs> yeah, and it's it, it's shocking when you when you see that data sometimes. It really is. Some of the little tweaks make all the difference in the world. Yeah. So one of the reasons I was uh, excited to have you was that, you know, there's so much great content online with, you know, long history of work that you've done. You know, there's YouTube videos and books and podcasts, but there isn't much specific to our industry. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes folks struggle with connecting the dots and, and correlating. Mm -hmm. How can I apply this in my specific industry or my position? So I was hoping to ask you a few questions that were related really? specifically to home remodeling, home remodeling contractors. We're all spending a bunch of money um, trying to make the phone ring. And um, so, you know, answering the phone properly, maybe the initial greeting or even just the initial conversation, what principles of influence should we be focused on trying to employ in that initial phone conversation to get things started off on the right foot? Well, first of all, we, you know, um, there has to be a human connection. And uh, that's something in the way that we introduce ourselves and welcome people. Uh, if they're calling us, if we're calling them, uh, we should uh, inquire as to how they're doing. Hope you're doing well. Before we move on, and we should uh, emphasize that we are their hometown um, uh, agent, uh, their hometown uh, home improvement company. So we're there's a we ness mm -hmm. there, um, and that our business has been uh, serving your neighbors and your community members, fellow community members, for. X number of years, right? So you give them that stability. But here's a, something in, that in the research shows us. You should say, we've been serving them uh, and they're a, a successfully more and more in each of the 16 years that we've been, right? Interesting. Because people project trends into the future. If you just say, we've been doing this for 16 years, well, that doesn't mean you won't be doing it next year, right? It's just, Correct. okay. Yeah. But if you say more and more or with greater and greater or with larger and larger numbers of people, they automatically uh, project that momentum yes. into the future that, oh, this, this person is moving because this person provides real merit and, and value. That's great. Yeah, uh, you know, and one of the principles we use is we get the question all the time: Do you service our territory? Do you service my town? And most folks will reply with a simple "Yes, we do." Whereas at our company, after studying your work, we say, "Yes, we have lots of happy customers in right your town." Uh, to yes, no, that's exactly right. I would just add this little Philip on, on the end of it, which is uh, we're getting more and more. Uh, as throughout our our our, our tenure, uh, oh, we've sure. gotten more and more people from your. That just tells you, oh, my neighbors are doing this. People just like me, people who are comparable to me, are choosing uh, Tony. And 
that installs the kind of confidence that you're looking for. And it's it's true, right? Yeah, <laughs> you have been growing. Yeah. You have to just put that in people's minds. Uh, it, it, it wasn't at the top of mind until you put it there. Right. And it was honest. You're entitled to say honest things about that that move uh, people in your direction. Yeah. That's fantastic. So another concept that I think is important for those of us that are visiting people at their homes and quoting projects at their homes, what can we do to pre-position ourselves before we get there? You mentioned social proof, you know, sending references or credentials, um, even a little bio on the representative that's coming and any background or experience they may have, um, because, you know, prompting them in advance, arranging things in advance, you know, that concept of persuasion. Uh, is there yes. anything you can do in that regard? Definitely send uh, credentials, references, uh, customer testimonials, star ratings um, ahead so that the, so that when they encounter your material and your 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 claims, the, the merits of your case, all of that is infused with the evidence that you provide first. I would provide those star ratings, those quotes, those testimonials at the top of any of the materials that you present so that the, the, uh, the credibility of those materials is supported by what their neighbors have been saying, it, not just you saying it. I, I would like that aura of authority and credibility to be present when they encounter every single thing that you have to say. Right? Wow, so even on a flyer or a brochure, for example, you would suggest having Google ratings and Better Business Bureau accreditation and things of that nature towards the top. At so, the top. At the, the first top. thing they see, we never see that, but it's the right. first thing they see. We we did some research where we did those testimonials and, and so on at the outset rather than later into the thing, or sometimes online you have to click to get testimonials. Right. And so it produced a 15% increase in conversions. Just where we put the um, uh, the testimonials. Wow! And and, and by the way, um, those star ratings are important. Uh, and uh, you 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 should don't worry if you get some that aren't five star ratings. It turns out that the most successful rating for converting somebody from a prospect into a a customer is a range between 4.2 and 4.7 stars. Interesting. Five people get suspicious. They say, uh oh, they're phonying this up. This can't be true. Not everybody gets everybody, right? Sure. So, and if it's below 4.2, then they're saying, well, maybe this isn't so hot, you know. But yeah. So don't worry if you're between the sweet spot is if you're between 4.2 and uh, 4.7, you're still fine. Wonderful. That's you're you're in you're in the sweet spot. People will see that as credible. They'll see it you as honest uh, and as worthy because uh, worthwhile because you you have such good uh, reports. That's great and. You know, it's interesting because the number of reviews matters as well, right? We always say reviews equals revenues in some sense because it, it, that social proof yes. provides credibility. You're exactly right. So the more you can have, four, you know, let's say 4.5 rating, uh, and then you list the number of reviews, except I would recommend saying the number of reviewers. Reviewers are the people you want to put the people in their mind, the image of people recommending, not some click on a on a on a scale. Right. So small change like that. I, uh, the more we can humanize our contact with folks, you know. So, for example, um, when you send materials, maybe you send them ahead of time, or you have. I mean, you have you said you had a little bio on the person who uh, might be dealing with them. Correct. Put that person's picture there. 
Yes. Put that person's foot and put that person's signature there in script. Don't machine print it. Make it personal. Make it make it human. We are living in a world now where we're being consistently separated from one another by technology. Mm -hmm. right? We now shop online. We just click. Uh, we're, we're, we're not sep we're, we're separated from people. We work online often. We we entertain ourselves. We click on uh, uh, on Netflix. We we educate ourselves by going to um, Google or Wikipedia. Sure. It's always with separation. People are yearning more human contact. So anything we can do that does that by for example, providing a photograph and a signature in in script. Interesting. Says there's a person there. You know, uh, Tony, in the last decade, there's been a 37% increase in preference for homemade products and uh, art, artisanal foods and so on. Um, and why? Well, when you do the research, because there's a person there, not a machine. Right. And technology is robbing us of personal connections. We're yearning it. So the more we can build that into our interactions. Uh, here's another one. Uh, I'm sure all of your uh, your listeners, uh, uh, all of the people who, who uh, uh, subscribe, um, have a have a website. Mm -hmm. right? There's research on six thousand seven hundred commercial websites where they did A B tests, where they put a feature in and took it out and looked at the difference in conversions. Right, things like, um, well, for products there was like free shipping, uh, or uh, technology it was a search function, so you could go through the the, the site easily. Even some sales related things like call to action lines. Was there a call to action line? So none of those things made as much of a difference as the principles of psychological influence. One of which was liking. Well, how do you get people to like you online? You have no contact with them, right? right. You never met them. They, they don't know you. It turns out if you put if you put a welcoming statement on the landing page of your uh, of your site, you get significantly more conversions to to your offer because you've welcomed them the way you would welcome somebody into your home, Invite. and people it melts their heart. <laughs> they want to do business with people who are welcoming and approving of them. So little things like that, that all focus on bringing human connection back into our communications that are that are separating us typically uh, because of the technology. Wonderful. On that note, I'm curious, you know, when we go into people's homes, we have the opportunity to connect with them at their homes. And, you know, we can see hobbies and we can see things of that nature. Uh, but in bringing a gift and stimulating reciprocity when you arrive as a guest in their home, is there anything you can do that's not going to come across as contrived or calculated? Is there something yes, that's really a good point. There, there's good research show, that shows that reciprocity occurs. When, when people, we have all been trained um, to give back to those who have given to us to be favorable, to be grateful to, to those who have done us a gift or a favor or a service of one sort or another. And you're right. So if you come to the home with a gift, um, that will trigger that reciprocity unless it's seen as a sales device, unless it's seen as artificial. It was designed not to give me something. It was designed to give you something that is my gratitude. For, for what you've done. So you can give small gifts like a list of, that, uh, of uh, 
emergency phone here here's uh, the phone numbers for a rapid uh, uh, contact of the police of your fire department other emergency services uh, and and so on uh, those kinds of things it doesn't cost you much you just sure. say here's something you can put it up uh, maybe even as a sticker uh, on the inside of a cabinet door or something like that uh, you could give them tips as to how to avoid fire hazards in the home, right? These things that are directed to your home, because that's what you folks are all about, right? Increasing sure. the worth and, and, and yeah, value of the home. So, you know, things like energy saving tips if you're in the replacement window and door business. Or well, business. yes, but you have, you have to be careful. It can't be something that looks like it's designed to sell your products. It has to be something that isn't seen as a sales device, but as a true gift. That's why I was suggesting it can be something away from the exact um, uh, products or services that you're ripping. Now, once you get their uh, 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 contract, then you can give them those kinds of tips as here are the things that will be best or most likely to give your home the most value or the most safety or the most uh, energy uh, uh, cons conservation uh, 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 opportunities, right? Got it. So, but but we have to distinct. We have to take away from their potential belief that what we're giving them is not a true gift. We can't. We have to take that away. So those kinds of pieces of information that improve the home in various ways, like fire hazards, uh, uh, you know, that that don't really involve your direct services, but you've given them something. You've shown that you are interested in them rather than your own self-interest in this. Some recommendations for handymen or other. Uh, reliable home service companies that have nothing to do with you in the event they need them in the future. Exactly. Oh, that's a good one. I, I even saw one home uh, improvement uh, uh, organization that was very successful. Now, this is a little uh, more costly gift, but they would they would give them people uh, a home hand fire extinguisher. One of these little guys. I don't know how much they cost, but they they swore that it increased their uh, conversion rate dramatically because it wasn't what I do as your home, uh, you know, uh, uh, improvement company, but I was looking to protect and improve your home. Sure. That to start out in that place really gets a lot more conversions. Wonderful. Now that might be too expensive for a lot of people, but well, I know of something very similar, Dr. Cialdini, of, yeah. uh, checking the batteries and smoke detectors because oftentimes they're they're out of date uh they're no longer working and that's a very low cost item you could do that really is a genuine oh, mistake. boy i like that one too i mean the, I, I bet if you folks got together in a uh in a little group and started thinking about what those things could be you'd come up with a, a dozen yeah we based on some of the research you've done we came up with something we call the depot directory and that's just a directory of uh, reliable home service companies that people can call other than us. Other uh, than us. Yeah. And, uh, now, if you want somebody to put in a pool, here's a place to, you know, or if you want somebody to do, to do something that we, we don't do, here's, here are some recommendations. Yeah. Everybody's so fearful that of the liability if that transaction doesn't work out, that it's going to be a poor reflection upon them, but that just hasn't been the case for us. No. Not if you have a list. I mean, if you have one, maybe. But if you have a list, well, no, these are just people. These are just organizations that have high uh, levels of credibility in the community. And so, as we were talking in the pre-call, we we talked about you know the ethics again of, of persuasion. And one of the reasons I I loved your research was because it gave me a blueprint to work within. And without that kind of framework, sometimes we we lean one way or another, just uh, fishing around for effective techniques. And of course, we want to stay with high integrity and, and with ethics. And what can you tell me about some of the differences? Because it can be a fine line from time to time. And, and uh, 
there's some folks that feel they have preconceived notions about persuasion as, as it is on its face. They feel like persuading yeah. others is, is maybe um, an unethical thing that, that yeah, they, they, they there's arrive a, at the conclusion on their own. Yes. There's an important difference between persuasion and manipulation. Um, but uh, let, let's, I'll go through that. And then I'm going to answer your question directly. What, how do you deal with rivals <clears throat> who are not being straight and offering people uh, low cost options that once you get, they get you, then they, they jack up the price. Uh, it's a bait and switch. It's some sort of a thing that uh, is rarely available. And, but they, they reel you in, but with these deceptive um, uh, offers, headlines and so on. So let's first talk about the difference between persuasion and manipulation. Persuasion involves it, it, informing people into yes. That is giving them evidence that's truly there in the situation. Let's say you have a unique combination of features and benefits that you can offer that nobody else can. Not in combination, none of your rivals can. You're entitled to bring up the uniqueness of what you have to offer, right? Um, uh, or let's say that you have been in business for a long time and you have shown this trend. You're entitled to that, right? It's not, that's pers that's information. You, you're educating people into a sense. But then there are people who lie with statistics. They, they claim that they have this kind of growth when they don't, or um, that, that uh, they, are, they have unique, uh, they're, they're unique when they're not. There are a lot of people have this sort of thing. So the key is to use these principles when they are truly in the situation by pointing to them. Right? And then you are persuading people in a way that's not only ethically acceptable, I think it's ethically commendable. You're, you're steering people in the direction of evidence that really leads them to a good choice. Right? Yeah, and that's we talk about that quite a bit is, is saving them from our competition, right? Yeah. Um, just you know, having references in nearby neighbors and specific ones, not just saying that we have them and uh, even crafting them uh, and organizing those references maybe people they work with or people they go to church with that way they can people who are more like them similar in right the... that's exactly i mean it sounds like you really have read my book and, and, <laughs> and, and worked times. with your team uh to uh, implement some of these ideas but also uh now let's get to the question what do you do when you've got these rivals who are offering 50 percent off or two for one and that's not really what they i mean that they're that's just to reel you in right? It's a bait and switch, or it's deceptive advertising. Here's what I think you say. You're entitled to say, you know, some of our competitors in the business will say this to you, and this to you, and this to you. And it turns out to be a deceptive, uh, false advertising practice. You will never get that from us. We will never do that to you. We commit to being scrupulously honest about everything we tell you from the start so you know exactly what your costs will be, what the benefits and advantages will be, and you define yourself as the honest home improvement unit, the honest company. The reputational advantage of that is enormous because people are worried about getting scammed. They're worried about being taken advantage of, especially in some area where they don't know themselves how to, how to calculate the costs and benefits ratio, right? They're, they're relying on somebody. If you can define yourself, if you can brand yourself as the always honest, never deceptive, Never, no tricks here, company. You actually throw shade now on the people who are doing that without naming them, 
just saying, we won't show you. If you see those things, we will never engage in the kind of um, duplicity that, that, that we know that involves. Right? Be, be confident. Yeah. Wonderful. Are there some real common pitfalls or real common uh, errors in judgment that marketers and salespeople make that you see regularly when, when kind of scrutinizing advertising, scrutinizing technique? What have you found? To be common. Yeah, here's here's the biggest one, I think. Um, and it's failure to to use the research and behavioral science around something called loss aversion. This actually won the Nobel Prize for a man named Daniel Kahneman uh, in economics a, a while ago, where he showed that people are twice as motivated to avoid losing a unit of value than gaining that same thing. You know the uh, the, the acronym FOMO, fear of missing out? Sure. People hate to lose. The idea of losing makes them crazy. So here's a study that shows how this works. It was done, it was actually a, a company that was selling um, ins insulation and weather stripping to mm -hmm. homes to uh, equip them to be more energy uh, 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 sustainable. Um, and they went to homes and um, uh, offered to do a, an energy audit where they could check all of the uh, leaks um, uh, that were, were uh, costing them money. And it would be different depending on the house, but let's say it was a, it was a $1 uh, so they would, if they insulated fully, they would be able to gain, that is to save, a dollar a day every day, right? right? If you did this, and you, that was for half of the homes. The other half were told not, if you do this, you'll be able to save a dollar a day. They were told, if you fail to insulate fully, you will lose a dollar a day every day i don't know if you can feel the difference yeah. between those homeowners could because of the loss language one word increased conversions by 150 percent because of something called loss aversion and we have been brainwashed into thinking that people only want to hear good things they only want to have positive no that's not true. Loss is stronger than gain. Yeah, right? I, I, I agree. And I, I think that, you know, there's really two primary motivators of human beings, hope for gain and fear of loss, right? And and as we get older and our target demographic is a 50 plus homeowner, right? right. And fear of loss is significantly more important to them. It, than... Especially for people in the senior level. They don't want to... They don't want to have a deficit. They don't want to lose. And by the way, there's an evolutionary reason for this that researchers have like that. It is that back in the day when we were sitting around campfires and living in caves, right? Losing something like a hunting ground or a path uh, to uh, clear water or something like that meant you might be gone. Failing to gain it means you're still alive. You're still subsisting. You're still able. You're still growing. You're still having, you know, your families and so on. But loss could end it for you. Wow. So that's why we are so uh, sensitive to the need to avoid losses in our lives. And so we could take the same dollar and say, you don't please, I would hate to see you forego or miss the benefits that would come from this advantages. Right? That's not to say you never tell people about the gains, about the, the, the things they will gain, uh, uh, benefits and advantages, but don't forget to tell them as well what they will miss if they fail to uh, to partner with 
you and uh, and uh, avail themselves of your services because those are the things that hit them particularly hard That's psychologically. Great. So a question about evolution we, you talked about you know going back to you know early years of man and and how that's kind of inherent in us because of the way we've evolved as human beings. Um, are we continuing to evolve? Is the human experience changing? Is, is, is these, these principles of influence, as I mentioned, I love them because they're a great blueprint or a framework, but are things changing over time? Uh, yeah, I, I think the principles themselves don't change uh, because they're just uh, too, too much embedded in us um, from evolution, but also from socialization that we've been through all our, our lives. The idea that you must not take without giving in return. That's something that er is taught in every human culture, uh, in, in every society on earth, uh, because it's beneficial to pay back those who have given to you. Otherwise they stop giving <laughs> to you. So it's, it's so those, those things are in us, uh, socialized from the outset. Uh, and, uh, we have very nasty names, don't we, for people who take without giving in return, right? We yeah. call them moochers or takers or uh, ingrates or teenagers, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody wants to be labeled like that. So uh, if we give, the, then we've triggered something very important. Well, these principles of influence that we talk about in, in my book and in, in my presentations uh, they're the seven universal principles. They're the ones that have been installed in us from the outset um, as a species. And somebody once said to me, um, relatively re recently, you know, Dr. Cialdini, this book that you wrote, this one over my shoulder here, Influence, it's now the Bible of online marketing. But when you first wrote it, there was no online marketing. How could you look ahead and identify what was going to be most successful 20 years into the future? And I said, I didn't look ahead. I looked within us. Mm. What, what are the drivers that have always inclined us to say yes? Social proof, scarcity, authority, liking, these kinds of things that have always worked well to make a good choice in a situation. Right? So you can change the platforms, but the principles, the drivers of ascent haven't changed. Uh, they don't, you know, things don't change uh, evolutionarily or in, in, in two decades. Okay, so that's one answer. Uh, the other is, it's gonna hark back to something I was saying earlier, and that is, Technology is separating us from one another. And as a consequence, we yearn for human connection. We yearn for those things that connect us to one another because we're losing it. Uh, we're just not uh, as, uh, as socially uh, connected and bonded to one another because of the technology. So what I think we have to do uh, in our own technology is infuse it with human connection. Mm. I talked about one example, um, putting a welcoming statement at the, at the beginning of your website at the landing page. First thing you say, show pictures of another person, the person who is going to uh, who's going to contact you about the services, give them a bio, um, uh, give them uh, a signature rather than a machine generated name. These are the kinds of things that reconnect us to a person. There's a person here, and in in this communication, uh, do you know, for example, that there's research to show that if you make the same request, the identical same request by email versus in person to person, face to face, 
face-to-face -face produces 16 times more assent to wow. the same request. Yeah. We need that contact. Yeah, we are social, I mean, the social media and, and uh, technology is great for giving out information about ourselves to communicating in, a, in an immediate and uh, 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 efficient way who we are and what we do. But to get the yes, it should be in person or on the phone or in a video call. And if given the choice, you would you would want to be in person. In person, you get 16 times more. In um, a video call um, is is next, then a phone call, and then finally email is the worst. So right. information is good uh, for technology, but not assent, not a decision. Wonderful. I wanted to talk a little bit about how companies can highlight their their strengths. You know, I, I, a lot of times I've seen on your podcasts and and uh, questions that come up from a lot of people that I surveyed and polled leading up to this interview. And people, you know, they they want to know which principle is stronger than the other, things of that nature. And I heard you mention that you know, really using the one that is most available to you, the one that is makes most sense for your you as a person or your organization or your product and, and, and exploiting it in that way. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I'm going to talk about it uh, both in terms of what you put into your message uh, that highlights your strengths and then what you put before your message and what we're calling persuasion. So um, <clears throat> whatever your strength is, has to be prominent in your messaging. So it should be first. It should be the first thing, if it's durability, if it's safety, if it's if it's price, what whatever it, it might be, quality, right? That should be the thing that you say that differentiates you, right? that, that idea. That should be upfront. Of course, there should be uh, testimonials before you uh, get to that, text speaking to that strength select your testimonials not just in terms of the ones who are most positive and flowery about you but who speak to your strength select the the quotes that speak to your strongest features right? so then when you talk about them they have already been endorsed by their neighbors by by people just like them, so that so. But now there's the question of well, how about before they even encounter your message? Here's where we come to the idea of of persuasion. There was a study done. It was a um, furniture store. They specialized in sofas online. You purchased online, and one week, every visitor to their website was sent to a landing page that had fluffy clouds in the background of the uh, of the wallpaper. The other half were sent to a landing page that had pennies, small coins. And then they were urged to go through the various options and uh, what was available and the dimensions and prices and so on of the, the sofas. Those who on the landing page saw comfortable, fluffy clouds opt to purchase more comfortable furniture. Those who saw pennies preferred more inexpensive furniture. Where did you route them first? Where did you take them first, right? So the idea is, before they ever get to your message, you should put in mind, even on the, uh, you know, what you, how you, um, what your logo looks like, what, 
what your uh, what your uh, model is and so on. It should be to the strongest feature of what you have to uh, provide so that people are primed for that idea before they get to it. And they then are readied for it to a greater extent. Wonderful. So you can do that with images. Yeah. Question, when we're presenting price, when we're reviewing a proposal of the scope of work, and finally having that big reveal of, of the cost of the project. Is there anything we can do at that point with imagery to get them to think about moving forward? Should it be related to our, our, our strengths or should it, is there some other imagery that may be prompting them to act now? So <clears throat> one thing you can honestly do is contrast your price to another one that is much higher that we could, you know, it's possible that we could do this, but honestly, that would add another $3,000 and I don't think you need it. So now the, the number isn't $18,000, it's compared to $21,000. So mention, mention another number, or this is what our, our rivals would, what, the average might be for uh, our, our most popular rival here in, in our community. They would be here. We can give you the same quality for this. So you always have a contrast. Right? I, I, so uh, I once worked with a, a spa, a backyard spa company, and uh, they were having trouble selling uh, their, uh, their more expensive models and uh, when I went over and, and looked at how they did it, when somebody came into this, they start would start with the least expensive. And then they say, here's our next most expensive. And then our next, and the here is our supreme, our highest quality one. Well, by the time they got here, that looked so expensive compared to what they started with. They were getting almost none. Right? But I told them, first of all, reverse that. Start with your most expensive and give them all the reasons. But if you're not interested, well, then we can do this level of uh, service for you or this level. And now those intermediate costs, some people will choose the larger one because there are always people who want the best. Sure. You can get those, right? But then the other people who are looking for a, a, a budget now the intermediate services or contract that looks significantly less expensive because it's contrasted to the higher one right uh, and <clears throat> we did something even more than that because uh, we did interview some of the people who did buy the the best uh it had a gazebo and 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 more uh, cup holders and uh, a heating unit and so on uh, around uh, the sides and uh, we interviewed them and they said it's like having another room on our house. We spend uh, we have our often have dinners there. We invite friends. We have drinks around the spa and and, and so on. This is in San Diego, so it's a warm place, right? And and we said to them, well, how much would it cost you to add another room onto your house? And they said, wow, well, that's over $100,000. Well, this is 25000 Okay. So now, even the top one got compared to a number that was legitimate, is relevant. The increased purchasing of the top model by 520%. Wow. By telling them the truth. <laughs> Just this is what this would can. cost if you put a room on your house. And it has it's serving the same purpose for a lot of the people who buy it. Wonderful. So I have 
one more question before we get to your resources and how people can learn more and how they can learn to like, execute on your on your principles. I recently, somehow it's escaped me in all my uh, study of your work, recently what's come to the forefront in, in, in looking at your material is a the phenomenon of mystery and how that can really spike lead generation and really spike inquiries and engage consumers. And, and by mystery, I mean uh, that riddle when, when someone says something in an ad like, we've been in business for over 50 years when the average construction company is only in business for five years. Yeah. There's three key reasons, uh, call to learn why or, or that type of thing. Something like that. Here's what I would suggest, which is really you picked up on this uh, brilliantly. Um, but it is to say oh, something to the effect of, now we've been in business for 16 years and we have increased uh, our success rate uh, throughout our satisfaction rate throughout something like that and there are several reasons for that right one is um, the durability of what we have to offer one is our commitment to ethics and um, and honesty one is uh, the safety associated with the way we do uh, the uh, the repair and so on right, right. and then there's one that was a that was more consequential than any of them. So now you've 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 told them all of the things that are great about you, and they're listening because they want to know. And then the and then the uh, the the coup de gras, the one that makes the difference, is our commitment to our customers, our service. To our customers both before during and after the project and that's that so they've been they've been wait they've been <laughs> they've been listening deeply to all your strengths and then they get the best one as the answer to the mystery right which they've been poised to hear yeah wonderful well that's great well i, I appreciate all your all your advice and your years of research and we'll continue to uh immerse myself in it as we apply it to the home remodeling industry and, and try to take uh, what you've done uh, and, and, and help folks in our industry thrive with it. And uh, if they want to learn more and go uh, directly to the source, what resources do you have? I, I understand you have some new resources available for folks. Well, yes, we just launched <clears throat> a new company called the Cialdini Institute. Um, and there we have programs for business people on how to become more effective and at the same time ethical in, uh, in applying the research of behavioral science to business applications, right? How do you take the knowledge that we have from over 50 years of research now into persuasion science and bring it to bear on the questions that you have to offer. So we have a, a, a online on-demand program. People can subscribe to it and then go in uh, and out as long as, as as often as they want. Um, and then they they can get informed. And they, if they want, we also have coaches that will help them through that program to hone. <clears throat> the insights that come from it for their particular situations, their particular industries. Yeah, and those insights, those nuances, like you mentioned, just with the subtlety of changing positioning of an ad, right. or, you know, it makes me wonder, you know, it, the placement of things, you know, is 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 a an ad about automobiles um, more effective on a billboard along the highway than it is about home improvement? where people get their messages, mm -hmm. you know, right. all that is, is yeah, no, this, this is really important because this is one of the, 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 uh, the pillars of this uh, Cialdini Institute, which you can, by the way, if you're interested, just go to Cialdini.com and uh, you'll go to our site. But one of the pillars, it's there, we have four pillars. Everything has to be research-based. 
Everything has to be applications based. This isn't just theories. Everything has to be ethical and everything has to be efficient. The, the, that is the way you can generate yes in the smallest possible effort, time and cost. You change the word. You change one word from gain to loss. You change the sequence of where the uh, endorsements are and so on, right? Small bigs, we call them. So uh, this is really important because people are overwhelmed these days. They want, the, they want the things that will be easily uh, implemented and will produce the biggest uh, impact on their persuasive success. So those are the things that we, we uh, focus on in that uh, Cialdini Institute set of programs. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. It's been an honor to uh, to meet you virtually and, and uh, get your insights and nuances. And we'll continue to uh, take your research and put it to good work. Well, I enjoyed it, I have to say. Thank you so much.